Football culture today takes us an hour south of Hobart to Jeeveston, which is the gateway to the southwest. It's also the southernmost point in Australia you can watch a game of footy from. Jeeveston is famous for its apple growing, particularly Morrow's favourite, the world renowned Jeeveston Fanny. This clash at Jeeveston was between New Norfolk and Commandy. Early Saturday morning, I caught up with Commandy coach Jock McGregor, who was reading about himself in the paper. I asked him the difference between country and city footballers. When well, I think at the country clubs, you, you really rate it on your hardness at the ball, and if you're not hard at the ball, you might you, you sort of get left out a bit more. Whereas at TFL, if you just had the skills, you could they could hide you somewhere and put you somewhere where you wouldn't be in the action. Whereas at country country clubs, I think they sort of they look down upon you if you're not really hard at it. So you don't get away with it as much, that's for sure. And not a lot of room room in the club rooms for receivers no, after the so game. No, yeah, so yeah, so you know, if you if you're not going hard at the ball, you they'll certainly you know, you know about it. <laughs> I've never been really superstitious about anything when it comes to the game day. I just I, chuck all the stuff I've, in the bag and off you go. Actually, um, you blokes have got lucky. I've, I've had a shower this morning. It's about the only thing I don't normally do. Just an old theory of mine that if you smell a bit, it might uh, put your man off. But <laughs> but uh, that might not be doing me much good today because I've had a shower. So um, now that's probably the only thing I've I regularly do uh, on a match days. I probably don't have a shower every morning. I just which is um, different because the Clarence boys traditionally wear perfume. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of them <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Actually, I'm pretty sure Windy wears something like that. So, <laughs> what's the key to winning at Jeeveston Oval? Uh, your hardness, your, your your ability to run hard at the ball. I think the uh, it's it's not it's not a huge ground, but I think it's actually one of the better sized grounds in the league. I think it's about about the size a ground should be in width and length. And I think we just got to be a bit more accountable today. Um, and make sure that they uh, every, every kick they get, they earn. The cars arrived early at the Jeeveston Oval, including these young fellas from New Norfolk who claimed they'd travelled all the way from the Valley of Love on an old bush track in their four-wheel drive. Meanwhile, the goal umpires, wary of the physical hazards of their craft, were doing their pre-game stretches. You're a level two goal umpire, that means you're top level? Yes, that's right, Dave, yes. Um, you do level one in your first year, then you progress to level two, and uh, then you're doing senior SFL footy, yeah. What's the most enjoyable thing about goal umpiring? I, I think as an ex-footballer, uh, taking up goal umpiring uh, in Australia is a, a real Australian thing to do, and uh, our, our funny hats that a lot of people don't like, but uh, we think they're great, and uh, I know the Americans, when they come over and watch us, they uh, really love the goal umpires. Do you train the, the two finger lean back, the timing of the uh, of the fingers and stuff after a goal? Oh absolutely, yes. Uh, training is she's full on. She's full on with the finger shoot, <laughs> both the uh, point and the goal. Excellent. Now, you have a bit of a pre-game routine. I noticed some stretching, so you're very careful not to do any physical damage. Oh, that's right. If you Believe it or not, goal umpires uh, have a lot of short, sharp running to do. And if you don't do the stretches, uh, my colleague uh, Marshall over there a couple of years ago did his calf during a, a very important final and uh, cost him the rest of the final. So you've got to be very, very careful. Little did we know that these jovial fellows would play such a huge part in the dramatic final moments of today's big clash. But more of that later. It was time to find out the history of Commandy from living legend Reg O'Reilly. Reg, tell us about the history of the ground here. I believe some trees were cleared and then it was used straight away. Yes, well you're going back a long, long time. Uh, Commandy was formed in 1887, actually the Commandy Football Club. Uh, but before that there was a lot of games played. They had four teams here and uh, they used to play amongst themselves. That is when they had time because work was always uh, the main thing before football. Uh, a little bit of cricket, that's about all. But they got in and cleared the ground and um, the first game came up unexpectedly, very quick. And they pulled all the stumps out of the ground and the holes were still there. And this is fair deacon, they had to play around the holes. They were full of water. <laughs> and people won't believe that. A few got in, but they've they done a pretty good and dodged right around it. I believe Liverpool and Commandy actually played a game of footy to decide whether the team was going to be called Liverpool or Commandy. Yeah, I think that's exactly how it happened. The team that won, uh, they called uh, Commandy after the team that won. Yes, yeah, that's how it eventuated, because Commandy is round the road too, actually, uh, where the hotel is. The early days, the games were played in, in paddocks. Did they have goalposts? Oh, yeah, they had to have goalposts. <laughs> they didn't just tie sheep to a rock? No, nothing like that. No, <laughs> no she was fair, Dick. They had goalposts, all right. Although current SFL premiers, Commandy's real football history belongs to the Hewan Football Association, where their arch rivals and favourite drinking partners were Signet. 
you get caught up in the, a friendly drink and the friendly drink went on until the Sunday so yeah, get back home Sunday night ready for work Monday morning. Yeah. What would football be like without beer? Yeah, well, now there's a point, yeah. It'd be tough, <laughs> wouldn't it? It would, it'd be a hard life. Yeah, I don't know many blokes who play football, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, oh, Wes. Trem tremendous how friendly it is down it here, is, Commander. Is, Very close yeah, yeah. to the players. Yeah, uh, not as close as some of them would like to be. <laughs> the Commandy boys were so focused as they ran out into the ground that they cleaned up our camera crew. As the game started, no one was surprised that New Norfolk, who were victors by 160 points two weeks earlier, were strong up forward. When Ziggy Haremza Jr. put this one through the middle, New Norfolk were 15 points up at quarter time. It's the easiest thing in football to do is to jump into someone and punch. Jock gave his boys a bit of a serve at quarter time, telling them to punch the ball away and stop standing back. In the second quarter, Kamani did bounce back, and young Twani started to take some good grabs and banged this beauty straight through the middle. Phil Jones was working hard through the midfield, and all of a sudden Commandy had a bit of run. When Jock McGregor pulled down this beauty of a mark and made no mistake, Commandy went to the half-time break with a one-point lead. But the scoreboard wasn't quite sure. However, our goal umpire mates Robbo and Marshall soon had the situation under control and I was able to get in and have some pumpkin soup. During the week we received a lot of faxes complaining about not having the taste test last week. So here we are back with my favourite part of football life and yours. And in the canteen at Commandy we're talking with Robin. Robin, tell us, you've got very, very red salves here, I've noticed them. Can you tell me what's in a salve? No, I can't. Do you know how they're made? No, and I don't want to. <laughs> what do you think might go into them? I wouldn't have a clue. <laughs> Never been to the butcher shop while he's been making them. Could be scary? Yes, yes, but everybody eats them. So they must be good. Are they split salves down here? Yes, definitely. That's what they ask for. Yes. Now tell us, I believe your speciality here is the pumpkin soup. It is, and it's made by Joanne, which will tell you what she has got in it. So I guess it's pumpkins, and it's, pr it's prepared beforehand and then heated yes, up on the day? I made. I made at home on Friday. Now we've got some pumpkin soup here. I'm going to have a go at this. This is uh, the pumpkin soup, as prepared by Joanne at the Commandy Canteen. Mmm. <laughs> oh, it's very thick and very nice. I give that 8.2 out of 10. Football supporters come in all shapes and sizes. Some are reflective and shy, while others are passive, deep thinkers of the game. And then there are those who are sweet and kind. Come on, Hawks, get it down! And yet others whose expression is one of unbridled passion. McGregor led from the front in the third quarter, bagging two goals himself to put Commandy in with a real chance. But when Chris Sproul bombed this one away, reminiscent of Malcolm Blight at Arden Street against Carlton many years ago, the Norfolk went to the three-quarter time break with a one-goal lead. In the final quarter, they were given this 50-metre penalty, which enabled them from point-blank range to go one goal up. As players remonstrated with the umpire, the Norfolk was brought back to the goal square to put yet another one on the board. Only the umpire knew So why. a second goal has now been kicked. The Commandy bench were really feeling the pinch. Meanwhile, the new Norfolk bench was looking very Bob Marley-esque. In the dying moments, Commandy plucked this goal from nowhere and then Jock McGregor himself ran around the mark to put this one through the middle and see Commandy home by the narrowest of margins. Commandy by one point. What do you think the difference was today, Jock? Just had a go, mate. Just had a belief in ourselves. Like, I think we went up to Boy and we had negative thoughts because we're playing on a big ground we've never played there before. And, and are, we, are we any good on big grounds because we like it nice and tight? But, I mean, this ground's a pretty big ground. I mean, we, we try to get that out of our heads. I just think it was all up here. And I think today we just, you know, our pride was on the line. 160 points, you know, and I, I told them it was pathetic. Every player was pathetic that day and, and we owed people here we owe them to show that you know everyone's been rubbing us telling us we're rub rabble and you know to, to Blair you know good on you Blair you know good call mate. As the commandy boys were celebrating they noticed the umpires hadn't waved their flags something was wrong our mates came over towards the scoreboard to sort it out for a moment the scores drew level. 9-14 visitors 
the new Norfolk supporters went wild. That's it. That's it. Correct. No, no, no. 68. A draw. Right, 68. Then the final adjustment was made. The boys in the scoreboard at last got it right and Commandy were indeed victors by one point. Doc, what, what went on there? Oh, the <laughs> oh Jesus. It's okay, we've got a beeper. Well, it didn't, cha it didn't change the uh, total score, but mate, I don't need that. Everyone's bagged us, said that we're, we're ununited and we're, we're fighting, we're rabble. You know, Blair, Blair Brownless, as I've already pointed out, you know, knows nothing about football. <coughs> nothing about our football club and call us rabble. He wants to have a good article, come down and put it to us then. That's one of the best wins I've seen from um, since last year's grand final and uh, that's what the boys from the bush are like. They just like to have a real hot dip and uh, they played well. Yeah. Now you're pretty fired up on the sidelines there. Do you like to pick out a, a particular player and give them a give, give them a serve? Oh, it's just a couple of idiots on the other team. You pick out, suck in and help stirs the boys up and you do your bit. Like you pay your six dollars to get into the game, so why not uh, give them a good old stir? And like being from the south and they're northerners, well we like to give them a good old southern welcome, so yeah. Oh, my God.